Welcome to Wildlife at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo. I'm Dr. Larry Kilmar, Vice President of Animal Science and Conservation. I'm standing right in front of our brand new veterinary hospital, which is part of our new medical and science complex that is under construction at the present time. Our commissary is completed, our medical hospital is completed, and now we're soon to move into phase two of our science center. So I'm gonna take you through the hospital right now and give you a tour. So we're inside of our new veterinary hospital and standing in the treatment room right now. And the important part to understand about this room is the size and uh, ability it gives us now to treat our collection. It's a very large room, but we might have a couple of surgeries going on at one time. We have great flexibility in this, in this room now. And if the animal is in this room and getting some minor treatment, we would then move this way into sterile surgery and it is just that, sterile surgery. It's a dedicated room, special air handling abilities here where we can do a very aggressive surgery. All of this is now a requirement in zoological gardens to have both treatment and sterile surgery. We have the ability to have the surgeons prepare here in, in anticipation of surgery, gown up, uh, get ready for surgery, walk in, as you would in a, in a regular human hospital. Again, the flow of this is very nice because as the animal is offloaded from receiving, it comes through treatment, it only has to make one turn to go into sterile surgery, which we did purposely so that we're not having to move gurneys back and forth and in and out of rooms. Some of the other nice features, if you look across, is the administration uh, office area where the vet techs and associate vet uh, have their offices. They can be monitoring what's going on in here if they're not part of the treatment of their surgery. The room then to the right of that is pharmacy. We'll walk over and take a look at that. Uh, this has a pass-through window and the purpose for that is that during surgery if there's some other uh, pharmaceutical that's needed they can simply move it through this window without having to go back through the office area and, and interrupt the flow of the activity. So it gives us some great flexibility. Nice large room to hold uh, all kinds of supplies and, and pharmaceuticals that we just didn't have before. So again, the advantage of this building is it gives us great capacity. We've waited many years for this building and now it's kind of finally come to fruition. And we've been, uh, had generous donations from the community to help us build this and support this. And now as we move on to the Science Center, we need additional donations to help build that facility. One last room I want to show you is clinical pathology over here. This is where all the blood samples, tissue samples, uh, whatever might need uh, diagnostic work is done in here. Again, this room, large, gives us great capacity for the future as we get additional equipment. Uh, to do the diagnostics here. Right now we have to outsource many of the diagnostics. We can all do it, we can do it in this room now because we have the space and we have the technology and, and most importantly, we have the staff that can do this as well. So everything will happen in this room right now. The nice feature is there's a side door over here. The keepers can deliver samples this way, go straight into the refrigerator that's below counter there and not have to walk all the way through the hospital to deliver samples. So again, helping keep the hospital clean and, and under hygienic control, which is very important, obviously, for a hospital. So again, this will be a behind-the-scenes tour, eventually, for folks, a guided behind-the-scenes tour. Uh, you can see it from the Florida Boardwalk. It's a beautiful building. So next time you're at the zoo and you're walking down the Florida Boardwalk, take a look off to one of your shoulders, and you'll see the beautiful new hospital and eventually uh, be able to sign up for tours. with Dr. Ball, Director of Medical Sciences at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo, and we're uh, right outside the uh, holding area for the Florida panther that we received recently. Uh, uh, Ray, tell us how, uh, tell us what preceded us uh, receiving this animal. This panther is a two-year-old male panther. He was found uh, between Naples and Immokalee. Um, a member of the public reported him on the side of the road. Fish and Wildlife Biologists immobilized him, took him to an emergency clinic, the Animal Specialty Hospital of Naples. He was triaged overnight, uh, emergency care, fluids, those sort of things. We got the call that night, we had this cat, and asked if we could you know, be responsible for the medical care and the continued evaluation of this cat. Okay. So, um, brought in ophthalmologists, uh, 
looked at the eyes, you looked at the general body condition, and, and what's, the, uh, what's the results of what you found during your, uh, your surgery or investigation, I should say? We, um, we had this guy for about a week, and we stabilized him, and then we had all the consults and the workup. The, the outlook for his eyes is, is not good. We know that he is blind in the, the right eye. It's actually physically collapsed. The left eye, while the globe is still intact, it's not very optimistic. The ophthalmologist and myself who evaluated it, there's a lot of inflammatory issues going on in that eye, and functionally, he, he is clinically blind. Okay. He had evidence of a lot of other systemic infections, a lot of complications from the gunshot wounds themselves. He has settled very well, as you can tell. He's very, very adept and calm uh, amongst us. His appetite has been fantastic. It looks like he's putting on some weight and we'll be you know, evaluating him hands-on probably in another week or so and um, make a determination about what he can do with. So this, this condition caused by what appears to be, uh, what, two gunshots, one to the head, one to the rump? Is that what you think? That, that's what I think. He definitely took a, um, a spray to the head and the right side of his shoulder and neck, and then as he turned to ran, he um, got another shot on his hindquarters. And, and probably this occurred several weeks before he was found? I, I would say around six weeks, because most of the, the pellet wounds themselves have actually healed up. Okay. So that implies there's been some length of time that this cat's been out trying to struggle to stay alive. Our radiographs uh, certainly uh, you know, validate all that. So here's a critically endangered species from the state of Florida um, that uh, ran into this issue. Uh, we're now uh, going to give it this uh, supportive care until such time as it's determined uh, cooperatively by ourselves and the state as to where the animal should should live long term. But this is one of the uh, one of the parts we can play at Lowry Park as we can help facilitate uh, statewide issues like this. Um, uh, unfortunately, we wish it wasn't under these conditions, but sometimes this is this is the part that we have to play. So this animal will receive excellent medical care. Again, specialists helping us determine. Um, anything that, that uh, we need to know so that the final determination, best place for this cat, uh, will be determined in the coming weeks so that uh, hopefully he can live his life out comfortably uh, wherever. So uh, uh, is there anything else you saw while you were working on this animal? It appears, would you say, to be about two plus years old maybe? or yeah, The biologists are estimating him to be about two years old based on his teeth. Um, having said that, though, he's about 50% of his normal body weight. He came in about a little over 60 pounds, and the adult males can be 110, 120 pounds. So again, a case uh, you can see him moving right now. I mean, he's a remarkably calm animal for this kind of environment, considering he was in the wild just a few weeks ago. Um, but I think he knows he's getting good care. So, Dr. Ball, thank you so much, and uh, more to more to come on this story. here in our new commissary and I'm with Caroline, the commissary manager, and we want to walk you through our commissary today to show you the functionality of our new facility and how the food flows. So Caroline, let's take it from loading dock into dry storage and we'll go through the freezers, okay? Great. Um, so we, behind you we have our loading dock which is going to be utilized by most of our deliveries that we get on a daily basis here at the zoo. CK's produce will pull right up, they'll offload their product and they'll be able to walk right into our walk-in fridge here. So um, there's doors to the freezer, into the fridge, and so they'll just be able to wheel their produce Come right on in. in, come on in. <laughs> and come right into this walk-in freezer, which is um, double the size of our last fridge, so we're able to hold a lot more product for our ever-growing collection. Okay. Well, this is important because now we can buy larger quantities at a time and not have to have so many deliveries. Also, the functionality is much better because basically it's, the truck is unloaded by the delivery person and our commissary staff, and we don't have to rely on a whole bunch of other people to unload. So it's really nice and cool in here, about what, 30 some degrees? We keep it a nice 38 degrees. Okay, and the other thing is the freezer that's on the other side of us, we can move from the freezer, which is four degrees, right? Yeah, right in, the into the cooler by this door over here. We also have a door on the dock, so we can now bring a whole pallet of meat into the freezer instead of offloading it case by case, which used to take four to five keepers about an hour off their job. So now it's just two of my commissary staff and me with a pallet jack, dropping a pallet 
and efficiency wise it's a huge improvement and this is probably triple the size of our old um, freezer so we're very excited about that I'll tell you it feels really good when you first walk in here but boy it's getting cold right now so let's go out now again as food you'd be moving through this door and the area that we didn't show you are basically two rooms where we hold dry food storage same thing occurs there the food comes off the truck on a pallet straight into that room and that's condition space and that's important because again in the heat and humidity of Florida uh, any bagged food any any grain material left outside for too long could spoil accidentally by just being out there too long so now we're in good condition space for our food supplies. So now we're passing by the laundry room, which is ever important for keeping our towels and everything fresh and clean. Yes, this is a, um, a great space that we've added in addition to the, um, the building. So we'll be able to store our waders that we use for diet collection for our manatees, but also um, manage our laundry services in here. <laughs> okay, so now you're a, you're a food stuff. You're coming down the hallway and uh, office on the left, of course, is important and comes right into the food prep kitchen area, which is, uh, boy, about, what, three maybe times bigger than the old one? Yeah, right around, right around um, that size. We kept the kind of the same basic um, floor plan because it was very functional before. We just expanded it. Um, so we just got wider tables and a, dip, a better um, setup for some of our larger equipment that we use to dice and mince our fruit. So my wonderful staff here is working hard to prepare our fruit diets for the day, which should be go mainly to aviary, but there's primates involved in that, and the rats from education get some of that. So there's a variety of diets that we do that involves the fruit, which is what we're working on now. Now we have uh, everything you'd have in your kitchen, garbage disposal, stove. Obviously, we just spent through the refrigerators, but we have uh, extra fast dishwasher because of the amount of turnover we need to clean uh, the products that we use in here. So how fast does this dishwasher this, work? This dishwasher will do a load in two minutes. Two to three minutes is what the run cycle is. And the nice thing about this, which we did not have before, is it's large, so we can actually fit one of these large bins that we do a lot of our diets in inside whole. And um, instead of uh, just having to hand wash it, we can truly make sure it's sanitized um, for our collection. And, and we have a lot of odd-shaped containers so we'll be able to put those in there and get them appropriately clean. So it's a great addition to this building. So we, we built efficiencies in not only to the way the food moves through, but the food processing. Now you also notice that everything in here is stainless steel. That way we're in full compliance with our regulatory agencies, uh, no rust to deal with, no countertop issues. So we went ahead with the additional expense and put in stainless steel, which will last us forever. Yeah. So uh, you've been in here now just a couple of weeks or a couple, well, maybe a week. Maybe we moved a in last Tuesday, so a little over a week and we officially moved in and started complete diet prep in here. So we're... We're still moving in and getting familiar with where everything's at. So you can imagine moving into your house, the hassles of moving into a home. Now imagine moving a kitchen all the way from the other side of the zoo into its new location. And we still have to keep the animals fed every day. We have over a thousand animals we're feeding every day. So you had to keep the kitchen operation going yep. and move at the same time. So I would imagine some pretty interesting challenges there. We did. It was definitely half the kitchen was doing diets. The other half was full of boxes unloading. But again, great teamwork by the Lowry Park Zoo staff animal department. And we made it happen. And there was no diet that was missed. So we did a good job. Another feature we have built into this entire campus is we have a backup generator that will support all of the uh, food freezer and cooler areas, which are very important to us. We don't want those to go down at all if we have electrical outage. And of course, the hospital is completely backed up by the generator. So if we're in an operation or wherever things, uh, things don't stop. So this is a behind the scenes tour. You'll have the opportunity in the future to do one of the tours of the commissary and hospital. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting walking through a commissary that feeds over a thousand animals a day. Manatee Hospital and I'm with Jen right now who's one of our senior keepers of this area and our, as, as many of you know we're the only critical care uh, not-for-profit uh, manatee rescue facility uh, in the country and we've now had well over 300 patients come through here most of them being boat strike cases uh, the staff has uh, been phenomenal they uh, 
they can do just about anything, I think, with a rescued manatee at this point, including uh, getting orphaned uh, calves to uh, go on to a bottle, which isn't the easiest. Uh, Jennifer's been here for many years and has experienced a lot of these different cases. And, and we recently released two animals. Uh, they were in here for what reason? What was their primary care? The two animals that we recently released were came in because the mom had been caught in a crab trap and the crab trap line had wrapped around both of her pectoral fins, cutting one very severely almost to the point of severing it. Uh, her calf was young, independent, and couldn't be on its own, so when they rescued the mom to bring her in to treat the wounds from the crab trap, the calf had to come with her, so both came in to the hospital for that. And uh, how long were they here for treatment? They came in August 26th and left October 23rd, so just about two months. Uh, luckily, she was caught in time before a lot of nerve damage had occurred. Um, when those ropes get wrapped around really tight, they can uh, reduce blood flow to the rest of the pectoral fin, and sometimes that part has to be amputated. But uh, she was lucky that, that she was caught in time and brought here where, uh, through antibiotics and other treatments, she was able to regain the use of her pectoral fin and go back out and take her baby with her. Well, this is just one example of, of, I said, more than 330 patients we've had come through here so far. And, and most of these cases uh, are preventable. People would follow the no-wake zone requirements, uh, probably have many less patients that come in with pneumothorax, uh, basically a punctured lung. Remember, manatee lungs are on their back, so that's the first thing that gets hit by the boat. So obviously that'll be uh, where they're most vulnerable. These aren't fast moving animals, they move slowly. No wake zones are there for a reason, so people will slow down so the animals can then move out of the way. Uh, and again, that's the majority of our cases, but we do have cases like Jen was talking about that come in for a variety of other reasons. Uh, this project costs us a million dollars a year to operate. Uh, and, and we're dedicated to this. This is our signature conservation program at Lowry Park to ensure the fact that these manatees do get the best possible care they can when they come in under these conditions and then get re-released. Re we have a great uh, high percentage of success with these cases, uh, but many, many hours have had to go into these rescues. So as boaters, uh, beware, be careful out there because we get the call uh, and basically we act as the mash unit for for these injured animals. Now, uh, Jen, in your time here, uh, uh, is there anything, you know, you, said you look back over the period you've been here and there's a, is there a case that comes to mind that was particularly uh, interesting or, or difficult that you had to deal with? There have been so many. I think the ones that stand out, as you mentioned before, are the young orphan calves that come in that are days old and the way that they nurse from their moms is completely alien to what we can reproduce here. So we do literally have to live with them in the water for about two weeks to teach them to drink from a bottle to take nutrition in the way that we can deliver it best. Um, there was one year we actually had five infant newborns at the same time trying to feed them all off bottles on a schedule as any mom could tell you um, wasn't easy but um, they all were able to be released so it's an amazing satisfactory feeling to be able to do that. Yeah, it, it, it many hours, I mean, long hours, wee hours of the morning doing all this. Behind us are the medical pools, and this is where these animals come in initially as critical care cases. Now, one of the things that we put in many years ago uh, were floors that actually raise up so we can dry dock the manatees to work on them. You can't work on them in the water. Very powerful animals, and even when they're dry docked, they can be, they, they can flip that tail and you go flying off the edge. So, so things like that that help reduce uh, having to drain that pool and lose water that that floor apparatus makes a huge difference to us and we might be you might be treating a manatee a couple times a day and and certainly with the calves and having to work with them very carefully having the ability to make those pools shallow certainly certainly helps uh, remember folks when you come to Lowry Park that again one of our major uh, signature conservation programs is the rehabilitation of manatees. It's, it's in our manatee fountain as you walk into the zoo. When you come down the Florida boardwalk, uh, please stop in and, and look over those medical pools and you'll appreciate now, I think more than ever, the amount of work that goes into recovering these animals. Pygmy Hippo exhibit, and we have a new arrival. Robin the Keeper over uh, the Pygmy Hippo area uh, was here the day the calf was born. So Robin, tell us what you saw. 
Uh, we saw Feed at first. Um, she uh, in the morning was uh, acting a little restless, so, so we uh, brought her into her back holding where she's most comfortable at. And we saw Feet first, and we were very excited. Um, after we saw Feet, it took a little while. Um, finally, we did call the vets over to see if um, Shaja might need a hand with a, with a new calf. And uh, luckily, Dr. Ball did a great job. Um, Stuck his hands in there and just gave her a little extra push, and out she came. And uh, it was funny. Jaja turned around and was like, "All right, that's enough." Very protective over calf, and it's been just amazing. Very exciting. So, uh, how big? How much did the calf weigh? We weighed her the day after, 14 and a half pounds. We actually wow. just got a weight on her Thursday, up to 32 pounds. So they my, gain weight quickly. My goodness! In about two weeks, then. Yep. That's. Uh, Oh, that's, that's incredible. So, uh, again, an endangered species, and this is our third calf uh, here at Lowry Park. Uh, the calf's on exhibit with mother, probably be in the pool when you come out to see it. Uh, but less than 50 of these animals in the country right now are working very closely with the Species Survival Plan of AZA to ensure that the species continues and thrives in this country. But interesting, though, we have a preponderance of females in the population. We actually need males. It's usually <laughs> the other way around. No one can really explain that. Uh, so how has Zajan baby been since? So far, so good. I uh, let her out a couple days afterwards to go for a swim. Um, she's been doing really great. Slowly increasing the pool level to uh, get her used to holding her breath and things like that. Because normally hippos do rest during the day, so she's getting used to you know napping in the pool, holding her breath, things like that. But so far, really, really good. Obviously growing a ton. Um, and mom is very protective, making sure the baby is fine in the water, fine on land, and showing her what to eat, nursing, all that good stuff. So it's been great. So that, that's phenomenal. And with your excellent care, I'm sure will this this baby will thrive to adulthood without any question. Again, these ca these animals can sometimes give birth underwater. They're they're capable of doing both. So nature's provided this great mechanism where the calf can survive if if mother gives birth underwater. That's usually a protective mechanism in the wild. So uh, little little pygmy hippos weighing nine to twelve pounds uh, could be easy prey for for predators of pygmy hippos. So again, uh, pretty much exist in West Africa, Liberia. Those places, uh, species is under, coming under a lot of threat in the wild. So next time you're at Lowry Park, uh, come into the Africa area, go down to the Uteri Forest, and take a peek at our new arrival. Thank you for joining me today and having the experience behind the scenes at our new hospital in Commissary. A lot more to come, folks. Thank you for joining me on Wildlife at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo.